try let's try this again. Number one ten. A twenty two year old male was walking on the beach and had sand blown into his eyes. He complains of pain and decreased vision to his right eye. Treatment should include A irrigating his right eye laterally, B flushing his eyes starting laterally, C irrigating both eyes simultaneously, or D covering both eyes and transporting. Like we said, the answer here is best A. Um, these, the pain is only happening in his right eye, even though he probably had sand in both eyes, we're only going to treat for what's actually causing him pain. We don't just want to start irrigating both eyes. Um, when it talks about doing it laterally, it's essentially meaning you have this patient um, position their head in such a way that their right eye is down compared to their left eye, kind of on their side. So I guess it'd be on this side for this patient. And you'd be irrigating starting from the inside corner of the eye and just letting like um, sterile saline drip through, like past the eye, and then down onto the ground. You don't need to move the saline around. That's why B isn't correct, because you don't start laterally. You just do it laterally. It, the wording isn't quite right. Um, and you want to do it in this way so that the saline that is probably carrying some sand just falls down versus like falls into the other eye. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's why the answer here is A. Sorry about the recording mess up, whatever happened with that. Number 111. A 33-year-old male was stabbed in the left anterior chest. He is conscious but is experiencing signs of shock. Further assessment reveals that his jugular veins are distended and his breath sounds are bilaterally equal and clear. This patient is most likely experiencing A, multiple rib fractures, B, a tension pneumothorax, C, a myocardial contusion, or D, a pericardial tamponade. Okay, so most people were saying D. D is the correct answer, pericardial tamponade. Remember, we had a question where we were talking about a few of these conditions um, probably 20 or 30 questions ago. We talked about, remember what it's called? Somebody's triad? Beck's triad is the word. Beck's triad. You probably should remember it. Remember, it includes JVD, hypotension, and a muffled sound from the heart. Is the classic signs of pericardial tamponade. JVD, because, the, remember, what's happening in pericardial tamponade, in case y'all don't remember or you weren't here that day, is that there's a lot of fluid building up in the sac that surrounds the heart. A lot of blood, usually. And so because of that, the heart now can't beat as well, because there's all this pressure from the stuff that's surrounding it pushing in. Um, so the heart is trying, but it can't beat as well. So stroke volume goes down, which means that blood pressure goes down. Um, they're going to have JVD because if they're not, the heart's not pumping efficiently, and so the body's getting backed up with blood. It's getting backed up into those jugular veins, and it's not going down how it's supposed to. And then the sounds will be muffled because it's trying to beat through that sack full of blood or something. And just like when you try to talk in underwater, um, the sounds are muffled. They don't sound does not travel as well through fluid as it does through air. So those are the classic signs of pericardial tamponade. And here, what you have with jugular vein distension. It's a, it's a real clear idea that that might be happening. Um, also, stabbed in the left anterior chest, which is right over the heart, so we're thinking maybe it, the knife got in like right next to the heart, either actually pierced the heart or maybe just pierced the sac that is surrounding the heart, which allows fluid to kind of push in and surround the heart. Um, why would we think not multiple rib fractures or tension pneumothorax? Yeah, because the, both of those would deal with breathing, and we don't know anything bad about his breathing. Tension pneumothorax would not have bilaterally equal clear sounds, and multiple rib fractures, they probably would have said something about shallow, painful breathing. Um, because typically somebody who has rib fractures is going to be breathing shallowly. It hurts to breathe too much. And they don't have either of those signs in the question, so we can't assume it's those. Um, and because pericardial tamponade is so specifically pointed to through these symptoms, that's the better answer than myocardial contusion. Bex triad, JVD, muffled heart sounds, and hypotension. You'll also see uh, what they call narrowing pulse point, I believe. Narrowing pulse point, narrowing pulse pressure. Narrowing pulse pressure. Basically, it means that um, somebody's blood pressure, which is typically like 120 over 80, the distance between the systolic and the diastolic number is going to shrink. So it'll be 110 over 95. Like the numbers will be closer together. And that narrowing pulse pressure is also a sign. Uh, usually, not every single time, but usually a sign of pericardial tamponade. 
What's up? No. Number 112. A hiker was injured when he fell approximately 20 feet from a cliff. When you arrive at the scene, a member of the technical rescue group escorts you to the patient who is positioned on a steep incline. The most appropriate method of immobilizing and moving the patient to the ambulance is to A. Immobilize his spine with a long backboard and place him in a basket stretcher. B. Immobilize him to a long backboard and use the four-person carry to move him. C. Apply a vest-style immobilization device and move him using a stair chair device. And D. Immobilize him with a short backboard and place him on the ambulance stretcher. And if you guys haven't looked at your operations stuff since we actually went over the chapter like five or six months ago, you probably won't know the answer to this. Anyone have a guess? A. A is the best answer here. So he does need a mobilization. Uh, it wouldn't be C because C with that vest style device, that's specifically for a car. And then again, it talks about moving him using a stair chair. Um, you wouldn't use a stair chair on an incline. You'd use it on stairs, but that's really what it's built for. It's not built for just other generically inclined things. Uh, because he's outdoors, that basket stretcher, that idea of bringing somebody down, that's specifically what it's designed for is this type of thing. Um, better than trying to use four people to synchronize their steps down a steep incline and safely hold the patient as well as keep themselves safe. And um, placing on an ambulance stretcher and trying to bring that up and down is, is a fool's errand. So the best answer here is definitely A. I think we've talked about this. Make sure you go back and are checking your operations uh, chapters before you take the test because there is a good amount of that stuff on the actual National Registry. Number 113. A 39-year-old male was struck in the head by a line drive during a baseball game. He is confused, has a large hematoma to the center of his forehead, and cannot remember the events preceding the injury. After manually stabilizing his head and assessing his airway, you should A. Perform a neurologic exam B. Conduct a rapid assessment C. Administer 100% oxygen or D. Apply ice to the hematoma C. C. Oxygen, yes. It's pretty clear based on what we're seeing so far that is the next best thing he needs. Number 114. A young male sustained a gunshot wound to the abdomen during an altercation with a rival gang member. As your partner is assessing and managing his airway, you should control the obvious bleeding and then A. Perform a detailed exam. B. Obtain baseline vital signs. C. Auscultate bowel sounds. Or D. Assess for an exit wound. D is the correct answer. Yes. Uh, when you've got a gunshot wound or you've got a gunshot victim, one of those things you need to remember is to always look for an entrance wound and an exit wound. You need to be able to see both, um, or you need to at least attempt to find both, because that will help you to know whether or not the bullet is still lodged inside the person's body. It'll help you better understand what, you, what you're dealing with in that scenario. And compared to everything else, nothing else on that list is particularly important um, for this patient, not right now. Number 115. A 44-year-old male sustained a laceration to his left ear during a minor car accident. Your assessment reveals minimal bleeding. Appropriate care for this injury includes A. Applying a tight pressure dressing B. Padding between the ear and the scalp C. Packing the ear with sterile gauze pads or D, covering the wound with a moist dressing. So let's look through these. A, applying a tight pressure dressing. Um, typically we do put pressure, you know, direct pressure on places that are bleeding, so I guess it doesn't necessarily fall short. Think about it, though, from the standpoint of the actual part of the body that is injured. Um, so you have a laceration on your ear. Now I want you to push your ear flat against your head and see if you think that would be super effective or comfortable in terms of bandaging a bleed on the ear itself. Not really. Because you're not actually dealing with like both sides of the ear. You're just dealing with the whatever part like the front part, and then you're pinning the ear back, and it's not the most comfortable thing. Um, B, padding between the ear and the scalp. 
that would offer the advantage of at least the ear is no longer now being held flat against the scalp, right? It's, it's in a position, the position of function, in normal ear position, and that allows you to pro probably address both sides of it. So you'd still want to do a dressing on it, but if you pad behind, now you've got padding or you've got a dressing on both sides, right? So that seems like a better fit. C, packing the ear with sterile gauze pads. What is it saying here? Putting gauze into the ear. Um, for one thing, we don't ever put gauze into anybody, any part of anything. For another, we definitely don't put anything into the ear. So this would not be correct. You don't want to start packing something in there to try to... We don't know what the lacerate, like where the laceration was. So, I mean, I guess the laceration was somehow inside the ear and you're trying to soak up the blood, but that's not really what it's saying. It's just saying, like, packing it full of gauze. Um, uh, that doesn't really fit. D, covering the wound with a moist dressing. No. What do we use moist dressings for? We usually think of like the abdomen. Basically, for anything that is already typically moist. Something that is usually inside the body and is moist and therefore needs to be kept moist. Not external things like an ear. So, B is the best answer. I, it can be a little bit misleading because you think, well, padding between the ear and the scalp, that doesn't control any bleeding. And yes, it doesn't. But of the options here, it is the only thing that you would do. You would do that, and you'd still do something more. You'd still need to do something to the ear itself. But that just allows it to be in the correct position by putting some padding behind. Does that make sense? Would you, like, tape it down or something? You would uh, tape the padding down? Yeah, like between the ear. Yeah, you'd want to secure it in some way to make sure it stayed. Or you might put padding behind and then put a dressing over the entire ear. Um, and it would kind of be like tucked in there behind the ear and also behind the whole dressing that was covering this side. Depending on your patient, and he's a male, so I guess you don't have all that much hair in the way probably for this guy. Yeah. Number 116. A 30-year-old male sustained a stab wound to the neck when he was attacked outside a nightclub. During your assessment, you should be most alert for... A, injury to the cervical spine, B, potential airway compromise, C, damage to internal structures, or D, alterations in his mental status. B, potential airway compromise. Um, it can be misleading because you think, oh, C-spine, that's important. Yes, but based on what's happening with that stab wound, we're not really expecting that he like managed to sever his spinal cord with a knife. We're really thinking... Okay, airway and blood vessels that are in there, we want to make sure that those are maintained and managed. So airway compromise is the main thing. Uh, and remember, it's not really clearly listed in this question, but remember we talked about that idea of air embolism getting into the veins. You'd also want to make sure of that, even though it's not listed. That's just a thing to keep in mind. Any sort of wound to the neck. 117. Approximately 20 minutes after initiating an IV line of normal saline, your patient complains of generalized itching and develops a generalized rash. These are signs and symptoms of A, a vasovagal reaction, B, acute air embolism, C, an allergic reaction, or D, circulatory overload. Originally, I was going to take this question off because it does talk about the IV line, but if you look at the answer choices, they, they're things you should know, basically. You should be able to answer regardless of the whole IV idea behind it. C is the best answer. Generalized itching, generalized rash, those are signs of an allergic reaction. Um, a vasovagal reaction, do y'all remember what the vagus nerve is? Do y'all remember anything about the vagus nerve? So yeah, so the vagus nerve is a nerve that runs in your body. Um, when you get to like college A and P, you'll talk about that stuff. But the thing you need to remember about it as an EMT is that stimulating the vagal nerve or the vagus nerve lowers your body functions. Um, specifically, it lowers your respiratory rate and it also lowers your heartbeat drastically. It can make them really shut down almost to the point of um, you can faint because of this kind of thing. Patients, especially you see this in older patients, they'll. Um, yeah, they'll call when they're trying to go to the restroom because they're, tr they're essentially like putting pressure internally trying to exert themselves to go to the restroom properly. And that internal pressure can stimulate the nerve if, if they're just kind of clenching up like that, can stimulate the vagal nerve, which slows everything down, makes them faint, makes them fall over. And now they're calling you because they fainted and they probably also hurt themselves in the process and they still have their pants down. I mean, you 
Maybe. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Maybe. Um, but you need to remember what the vagus nerve is, what a vagal reaction is. It, it has to do with the stimulating that nerve, and you're going to see those uh, functions drop. And that is not indicated here based on what we see. Acute air embolism, what would we see with an acute air embolism? Yeah, an air bubble somewhere. We don't know where. Um, but we would, we would see some signs. We might see, uh, most likely it would either look like respiratory problems, if it kind of got lodged somewhere in the lungs. Um, if it was a heart thing, you might see a problem with their heartbeat. Um, you might see some altered mental status if it lodges somewhere up in the brain, because what it's doing is it's stopping blood getting where it's supposed to go. It, like, it's an embolism. Um, however, none of those things are shown here. This generalized itching and rash are an allergic reaction. And circulatory overload is the only thing out of all these options that really, um, I guess it's not the only thing that has to do with an IV. It's the only one I would think of that maybe y'all don't know about because it has to do with an IV. Do y'all know what circulatory overload is? Basically, it's when your body literally just has too much volume. So blood pressure goes up. Because, and it usually will happen like this when you push IV solution, or especially if you push a bolus, meaning a large amount at once versus a slow drip. Um, the volume will rise, and that will cause your blood pressure to rise. And that's what it's talking about with the circulatory overload. So you wouldn't really necessarily know that, but you could still answer this question based on what you know about what causes itching, rash, that kind of thing. Number 118. A 50-year-old female is found semi-conscious by her son. Your assessment reveals that her respirations are slow and shallow, and there is vomit is draining from her mouth. When you attempt to suction her oropharynx, she begins to gag. You should A, ensure that her airway is patent, attempt to insert a nasopharyngeal airway, and assist her ventilations with a BVM device. B, abort the suction attempt at once, preoxygenate her with a BVM device, and prepare to perform endotracheal intubation. C, continue to suction her airway until the secretions are clear, insert an OPA, and ventilate with a BVM. Or D, remove the suction catheter immediately, insert an NPA, and administer oxygen via a non-rebreathing mask. So the best answer here is A. Ensure that her airway is patent, attempt to insert an NPA, and assist her ventilations with a BVM. So, um, looking at the other answer choices, B is wrong, why? We don't do intubation, yeah. Um, if I were to rewrite this question, I wouldn't even put that in there because we don't do it, but for now, it's still the wrong answer regardless. C, why is C wrong? She has a gag reflex with the suctioning, so you clearly cannot put an OPA in this patient. And then D, why is D incorrect? She does not need a non-rebreather. She needs um, a BVM. And also, D does not clearly say that you're going to try to you know, make sure her airway is still clear. A, a is the only one that really says that, which is good, because remember, she had vomitus in her mouth. Um, she's beginning to gag, so she may either throw up more or at least have more, like, saliva secretions in her mouth. So you still want to make sure her airway is open. You may not be able to suction again, or at least not right away, uh, but you still do want to be careful of her airway. And that A is the only answer choice that kind of mentions that specifically. Number 119. A 54-year-old male accidentally shot himself in the leg while cleaning his gun. Your assessment reveals a small entrance wound to the medial aspect of his right leg. Remember, medial as in towards the middle. The exit wound is on the opposite side of the leg and is actively bleeding. The patient complains of numbness and tingling in his right foot. You should A. Assess distal pulses as well as sensory and motor functions. B. Manually stabilize the leg above and below the site of injury. C. Gently manipulate the injured leg until the numbness dissipates. Or D, control the bleeding and cover the wound with a sterile dressing. D, yes, D is the only thing that really is answering this question of he's bleeding, you have to fix the bleeding. Um, you want to control that, that bleeding, cover the wound. You definitely don't want to do C. We already talked about how just manipulating an injured limb is really not the best way to somehow try to you know, get a pulse or, or get sensation back in a, in a limb. It's not appropriate. Um, stabilizing the leg maybe wouldn't be a bad thing because we don't actually know where this wound is, but there's also nothing to point to that we have to do that. We don't know of anything broken. And we definitely do know that it's bleeding, so D is the best answer. 
120. You and your partner arrive at the scene of a fire at a large office complex. Witnesses tell you that they heard a loud explosion shortly before the building caught fire. You should A. Carefully document the witnesses' statements and report them immediately. B. Ensure that your ambulance is parked upwind and uphill from the building. C. Don your BSI equipment and begin searching for critically injured patients. Or D. Tell the witness that you suspect that the explosion was the work of a terrorist. B is the best answer. Yes. Um, C is definitely incorrect. Why? You're not, you always do BSI, but you're not responsible for searching for patients. You're, you're not responsible for extricating them, um, for cleaning them up. You're responsible for treating patients. D is definitely wrong. Why? Yeah, that's, it's just wrong. Like, that's not what you do. It's not your job to declare that it's a terrorist attack. Um, number one, you're probably wrong. Like, probably wrong. Number two, even if you were correct, it's not your job. And number three, even if it was your job, saying it in this manner is only going to incite panic. Like, it's just not appropriate to say, oh, yeah, this was a terrorist attack. Like, that's not going to do anybody any good. Um, and then between A and B, B is more having to do with your safety, your partner's safety, and that's why B is the better answer. Um, it's good to get witness statements. That's more the job of the police or, or somebody else, police fire, somebody who deals with that kind of thing. Um, but really, for your own best answer, you want to make sure that you and your ambulance are nowhere near what's going to happen down here. So if you're upwind and uphill, you're not in the danger zone, is the idea. Number 121. A 40-year-old male was in his woodworking shop when he felt a sudden, sharp pain in his left eye. Your assessment reveals a small splinter of wood embedded in his cornea. You should A. Scrape the splinter away with moist sterile gauze. B. Cover his right eye and flush the left eye with saline. C. Cover both of his eyes and transport to the hospital. Or D. Remove the object with a cotton-tipped applicator. C. C is the best answer. So we kind of already talked about this. If you've got a pain um, or an injury to one eye, you do want to cover up both eyes for this patient. Remember, the eyes tend to move in tandem. They aren't really capable most of the time of moving completely independently of themselves, of each other. And so if you only cover up the one eye, say, say it's, um, we don't have a, okay, pain in the left eye. So if his left eye is experiencing pain and you only cover it up, the right eye is still going to be moving and tracking stuff in the room. And the left eye, even though it's covered, is also still going to be moving and tracking stuff in the room. Uh, it doesn't just stop just because it's behind a, behind a cover. So you want to cover both of their eyes. Uh, a and D are both wrong because we don't remove impaled objects like this. Uh, we, we had the one question with the sand and like flushing out sand is one thing. Actually removing like in a specific object is another thing entirely and we don't do that. Number 122. A 50-year-old male was splashed in the eyes with radiator fluid when he was working on his car. During your assessment, he tells you that he wears soft contact lenses. You should A... Leave the contact lenses in place and flush his eyes with sterile water. B. Remove the contact lenses and cover his eyes with a dry sterile dressing. C. Leave the contact lenses in place and cover both eyes with a dry dressing. Or D. Carefully remove the contact lenses and then irrigate his eyes with saline. Say it louder? Okay, so we have different options. Um... Let's see, the first question, or the first decision we should make is, should we remove the contact lenses or not in this case? In this case, actually, yes. Um, it's not, or it, it's going to impede your ability to properly treat and irrigate underneath. Well, I kind of already answered the question. The answer is D. Okay. Uh, you're supposed to remove the contact lenses so you can irrigate underneath. You want to try to wash this chemical out basically. So the only way you can really do that is to try to remove the lenses. Now, if, he, if the eyes are extremely painful to the point where he can't touch them, like he can't allow you to remove the contact lenses or he can't remove them themselves, um, you, you kind of have to work with what you've got. If his eyes are so swollen shut, then that's, that's one thing. But we're not assuming that at this point. We're assuming that you're capable of accessing his eyes, and they're probably a little bit painful, but you're still able to treat them. So the best treatment would be to remove the lenses so you can properly irrigate with, sta with saline, sterile saline. 
123. A 67-year-old male presents with weakness, dizziness, and melena that began approximately two days ago. He, des he denies a history of trauma. His blood pressure is 90 over 50, and his pulse is 120 beats per minute and thready. You should be most suspicious that this patient is experiencing A, an aortic aneurysm, B, acute appendicitis, C, gastrointestinal bleeding, or D, intrathoracic hemorrhaging. That's a good question because that holds the key to what this, um, what the correct answer is. Anybody remember what Malena is? Blood in something. Blood in the stool. Yes. Uh, meaning in his feces. So the answer would be C, right? Malena tends to look like like coffee grounds, like black streaky kind of. Um. Would it be very hard? Yeah. No, it, it's black because it's been oxidated by all the stuff that's going on in your system, um, so it'll be really dark, but it, it'll be, I guess, mixed in texturally to some degree. Like, it's not going to be hard yeah. pieces or something, no. It's not going to be like clots all by itself. It's going to be bleeding along with. So just, um, so yeah, knowing what Malena is would help you answer this question, because otherwise you'd have no idea. Um, you would know it has something to do probably with him going into shock, probably blood loss maybe, but... Um, that's about it. So, C is the correct answer. That's a word you should know. 124. A 25-year-old unrestrained female struck the steering wheel with her chest when her car hit a tree while traveling at a high rate of speed. She's experiencing signs and symptoms of shock, which you suspect are the result of intrathoracic bleeding. Which of the following interventions will provide this patient with the greatest chance for survival? A, 100% oxygen administration. B, full immobilization of the spine. C, applying and inflating the PASC. Or D, rapid transport to a trauma center. What is this patient's chief complaint or primary life threat? She's going into shock. She's going into shock, which is happening because of... Yes, so intrathoracic bleeding, um, it's important to note that because what is the PASC used for? Do you all remember? It's used for shock, but what, what kind of... It's, yeah, it's used specifically, uh, we also use it for people who need to have their pelvis stabilized, who've lost blood because of a broken pelvis. You could use it for just a patient who's generally in shock. It's kind of a last resort. Um, because remember what the PASC does is it's squeezing essentially the entire lower half of your body, squeezing most of the blood out of it. So you're probably not going to do so well with things like toes. Um, and you don't want to use it just casually to, to fix shock. So which of these things would best fix shock based on her hemorrhage? Which one of these things would best fix shock? Can you fix shock on the ambulance? Yeah. No. Who can fix shock? No. Where do you find, yeah, D. D. Bring you to a trauma center. You do, yeah. Like, that's why that you have to listen to the question very carefully. It's not saying which one would you do first or which one you do at all. It's saying which one will provide this patient with the greatest chance of survival. So you have to look in this case, essentially you're kind of looking at definitive treatment or at least treatment specific to what is really wrong with her. Um, and the best answer for this would be rapid transport. If it was a question that was really talking about like respiratory distress, that is something you can actually help with on the ambulance. So the best thing you could do for that patient would most likely be some sort of oxygen uh, or ventilatory assistance. In this case, you can't actually do anything. You can position her and you can uh, rapidly transport. Remember how we treat for shock? We cover them up, oxygen, elevate their feet, and rapid transport. Because that rapid transport is the thing that actually is going to help eventually fix the shock. The other stuff is just kind of management and maintenance on the way. So the best answer here is D. 125. A 52-year-old unrestrained female struck the steering wheel with her face when her truck collided with another vehicle. She has obvious swelling to her facial area and several dislodged teeth. A visual exam of her mouth reveals minimal bleeding. She is conscious and alert with a blood pressure of 130 over 80, pulse of 110 beats per minute, and respirations of 22 breaths per minute with adequate tidal volume. You should A, 
apply supplemental oxygen, immobilize her spine, attempt to locate the dislodged teeth, suction is needed, and transport. B. Assist ventilations with a BVM, provide spinal immobilization, suction her oropharynx for 30 seconds, and transport. C. Fully immobilize her spine, attempt to locate the dislodged teeth, tilt the backboard to the left side, and transport. Or D. Apply oxygen via non-rebreathing mask, suction her airway as needed, disregard the dislodged teeth, and transport. So there's a lot of information in this question, and there is a ton of information in the answer choices that we need to talk about. Let's see what we can kind of attack first. Um, looking at her vital signs, her blood pressure, her pulse, and then her respiration. So uh, all of these things seem to say something-ish having to do with respirations or oxygen. She's breathing 22 breaths per minute with adequate tidal volume. What would you do as far as oxygen therapy for this patient? Okay, so not a BVM in other words, right? Yeah, um, that would point to B being wrong. B is also wrong because how long do you suction? 10 to, 10 to 15, definitely not 30. So B is absolutely wrong for both of those reasons. Um, let's see what else. Are there any others that don't have the appropriate type of oxygen therapy? C doesn't mention anything. So if everything else in C was correct, maybe we could consider, well, they just didn't give a complete answer. But uh, realistically, we want to try to go for one of the answers that does include oxygen. Because remember, for the sake of the National Registry, every patient gets oxygen. That's how we've tested and practiced in terms of the skills. It's the same thing on the test. Everyone gets oxygen. So between A and D, what kind of difference do we really see? Yeah, A, A mentions immobilizing her spine, which is, I guess, a nice step. Like, it certainly wouldn't be wrong. But the real difference here is um, disregarding the dislodged teeth versus locating the dislodged teeth, which is the better way to do it. You would want to locate them, if possible, because uh, you want to take them along with. They can potentially. With, with any body part that a patient loses, any, anything at all, whether it's an amputated finger or dislodged teeth or anything else, you want to carry it with you on the ambulance, um, if at all possible. You're not going to make it the priority versus giving your patient oxygen, but it is something that you should attempt to do if that situation ever arises. Also, if we look back at A, there are good things in it. Immobilizing the spine is actually pretty important. You've got a truck colliding with another vehicle, that kind of, you would want to do spinal immobilization. And then A also includes suction, which D does not. So overall, A is the better answer by far. And it's the correct one.